thank you so much for being here. It's exciting to be uh, in Hamburg and to be with all of you. And it's really difficult to follow that introduction. So I'll, I'll let me try to give it justice. One of the things that, that people tend to do when they speak in front of an audience this big is talk about themselves and talk about how great they are. And you have my word, this is not a 20 minute commercial. This is not me spending 20 minutes talking about how great I am or my company is. I'm going to take three minutes to introduce who I am and who my company is. And then I want to talk about something way bigger. I want to talk about media and you. I want to talk about your life and how it's being shaped by media. Uh, so first, a little bit of context. Uh, uh, media, and more specifically, advertising-driven driven media, will be a trillion-dollar industry in eight years. There are, are very few trillion-dollar industries, and this is part of the reason why the biggest and most powerful companies in the world are trying to participate in the market, because it's really hard to move a, a needle on a massive P&L if you're not in big markets. So this industry, which is growing at roughly 4% a year and right now $725 billion, will be a trillion dollar industry in seven and a half, almost eight years. So in terms of my journey, I told you I'd give you three minutes on who I am. I started as a media buyer in a tiny little ad agency in Los Angeles and was really frustrated why, by the way ads were bought and sold. I did not understand why the world of Mad Men had to be the world of Mad Men. Why did I have to have drinks with people to buy ads from them? I did not understand why the world worked that way. And so I've spent the last 25 years really trying to change the way it worked. I started an ad exchange. I sold it to Microsoft. I went to work at Microsoft and tried to search the world for ways to make win-wins. Like, I don't believe in building businesses or building anything really that can be sustainable if you're not looking for win-wins. If everybody isn't better off, I, I believe that's sort of the opposite of a win-win. So I power one of the biggest companies you've probably never heard of. We're about the size of a Pinterest or a JetBlue Airlines. Uh, when we went public, we were uh, a $600 million business. By the end of the day, we were a billion dollar business. Uh, uh, about a week and a half ago, we became a $10 billion business, uh, which is about two and a half years after, after we went public. Uh, we, were, we went public in what I think is the most hated sector in, in, on Wall Street or in the global economy. Uh, uh, people hated ad tech. There have been so many casualties. There's been so many bad stories. Uh, uh, there were a lot of people that didn't want to believe in us. So if you asked me to explain why in the world have you gone from a $600 million company to a $10 billion company in three years, I'll tell you that it's because of what Wall Street believes about us. And that is, when we first said that we were competing with Google, Facebook, uh, and the likes of, uh, of those massive media companies, I think people were betting against us. And they've come to believe something very different today about the possibility of the internet, and that's what I want to spend today talking about, the possibility of the internet. More specifically, we are having a very important discussion right now around the world about how the internet is going to pay for itself. And that's where I want to focus the conversation today. To finish my three minutes on who we are, we are not a media company. I don't own any media. So uh, unlike a Google uh, uh, where most of their money is made on destinations they own, at Google.com or YouTube.com or a Facebook, all of their money is made on properties that they own. Or TV companies, I don't own any of that. We don't have a, a website that monetizes anything. You go to the tradedesk.com, you can apply for a job. That's, that's really all our website does. Uh, but we do power nearly all of the Fortune 500 brands. And we go to them saying, we, uh, uh, are, we're objective. We don't own, because we don't any, own any media, I have no dog in the hunt when we're trying to help you figure out, should you buy Spotify or the New York Times or Hulu or, or Roku or anything else? We're just trying to objectively help these brands buy. And because we've gotten rid of that objectivity problem, we, we win trust more easily than somebody who doesn't. Now, I'm going to say something that is, uh, I'm going to share something else about us that is a little bit uh, difficult to understand. When we talk about, hey, we're not a media company, we're not conflicted, that actually has another side to the coin, which is also a benefit to us, which is that uh, we can partner with anybody. So I think we may be the only company in the world who can partner with Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, um, Apple, uh, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. 
and we've partnered with all of those but one. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait to say which one until we announce it. So uh, this is me uh, uh, talking a month ago when we launched our product uh, uh, in China uh, with the chief data strategy officer at Tencent. All right, I told you I wasn't going to talk about us the whole time. I'm done with us. Let me now talk about the bigger issue. I think right now is a very important moment in the history of the internet. And there's a whole bunch of things that are happening beneath the surface that, that a lot of people don't understand how significant they are. And I want to just shine a little bit of light on them and talk about the significant conversation that should be going on right now. I believe there is a lot of influence in this room. I believe there are a lot of people in this room that can affect the outcome of where we land. And I just want to really start a conversation. And if you leave having thought something you didn't before, mission accomplished. So Google, Facebook, Amazon have aggregated more power, more global power, than any three companies ever. And keep in mind, if you walk down the streets of New York City, you'll see uh, uh, buildings named after very powerful men, uh, guys like JP Morgan or Vanderbilt or Carnegie. These are like big names, really from 100 years ago. They were titans of their industries, things like steel and oil. Uh, I believe these companies are more powerful than those companies ever were, and, these, and the men who control these companies and the women who control these companies, 100 years ago it was just men, now it's men and women control these companies. They are more powerful than the, they, they were 100 years ago. These companies affect the outcome of elections. I'm not sure that that happened to the same degree 100 years ago. And what's happening as these companies are aggregating power is whether it happened on purpose or not, we are currently in the middle of a tug of war over control of the internet. And in the middle of this tug of war, we're, we're having to answer questions like, how are we going to pay for the internet? How, how, how do we want the internet to exist? How important is privacy to us? These important concepts are happening, but there's even something bigger than that bigger than those individual concepts. Those are all lumped in to the internet has historically been a very democratic place. And as we acquire or aggregate more power in a couple companies, then uh, do we want to find mechanisms or do we even want to federate the power so that it's distributed the way that it was in the internet before? One thing I want to say, especially because they're my partners of all these companies that I'm talking about, I don't believe there is really a concept like they. When we say, at Google, they think dot, dot, dot. Google's a big company. There is no they. There's a whole bunch of different opinions at Google, too. There's different opinions at all of these companies. There is no they. But there is a they when we talk about that aggregation of power. And so whether we uh, accidentally use it in a bad way or not, the power has aggregated. And that's exactly what this day, I hit it, does it go? What this day uh, was about. I believe this was one of the biggest moments in the history of the internet. And I, I, I think everything changed on this day for the internet going forward. And this, this day was not just about privacy, that was part of it. But it really was about how could one company, either advertently, inadvertently, or even sort of accidentally empower somebody else to affect the outcome of, a, of an election. That's what this was about. A and there were some interesting byproducts of this day, which is, uh, I think, big uh, uh, executives uh, uh, at Google and at other places watched this and said, we never, ever want to sit in that chair. And I think a whole bunch of other people looked on and said, uh, uh, wow. Uh, U.S. legislators don't know a lot about the internet. <laughs> um, and I think between all of those things, people said, we need to make some changes. We need to avoid moments like these. We at Google or at Facebook, we never want to have to sit in this seat again. So uh, let me skip to the end of the book a little bit and just tell you that a a as a, a collective group, we will find a balance between privacy and relevance. And by relevance, I mean relevant content, relevant ads. We are going to find a balance between those. But there's a whole bunch of room in between those two things where we can la land and create permanence. Uh, uh, and there's a whole bunch of outcomes. So it's not like 
hey, this is going to work itself out, and if we do nothing, we'll get to the same result as if we do something. This is not one of those outcomes. If we do something, it could land at a very different place than if we do nothing. So let me talk about one of the other uh, uh, forces that is beneath the surface that I don't believe has been talked about enough. Uh, uh, and that is, Apple does not make any of their money directly through advertising. And so as this privacy stuff has been going on, especially uh, uh, when Mark Zuckerberg had to testify be before Congress, Apple saw this as an opportunity. And I had hoped that they would take the high road. And they claimed to have taken the high road. But I don't think they did it as well as they could. So I'm going to be a little bit critical of Apple here, only because I want to, to plead with them to be a little bit better. Uh, um, so just a reminder, the undercurrent is Google makes 95% of its money plus from, from advertising. And Apple makes directly almost none from advertising, which is why at CES, this last year, so uh, a, a few months ago, uh, Apple was able to put up this billboard taking over an entire building. What happens, on, and by the way, the train, I, I looked for a picture to show it, but I couldn't. The train uh, uh, was branded with a, a wrap that said, hey, Google. So hey, Google, what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone, which I think is really disingenuous because it's not accurate. Because every time you go fill out an app or, or download a new app, you know that you get a, a request that says, hey, would you like to share all your pictures, all your contacts with app XYZ? And then you say, oh, is there any other choice? I either I don't have the app or I set, hit OK. And then you hit OK. And you go to the next thing. All your information that was disclosed, and it was disclosed, was just shared with Apple, the same way that it works with Google or anybody else. And those people use it for, uh, to show ads and relevance. And that's how the App Store is so powerful and successful for, for Apple. And so it is way bigger than just Apple's uh, focused on privacy and Google is not. It's actually what I'd hope they would have done is start a better conversation about the quid pro quo of the internet, which is that if, if you want to access things like Facebook, you have to see relevant ads for the most part. Now, uh, uh, a lot of people have wrongly assumed that uh, the internet is mostly made up in, of Google and Facebook. And this is something I think Wall Street thought before we went public. Something that's happened since then is that we've been able to demonstrate to them that while there are seven plus billion people in the world, Facebook only has two billion active users. And YouTube has only two billion active users. And, and while we represent 3.5 billion today, I mention that only to say that the rest of the internet is very big. And there is a huge opportunity for a lot of other companies to be successful than just being a, a single destination. Those destinations are amazing, but there's more to it than that. I think the internet, when it's at its best, is fueling what philosophers have called the marketplace of ideas. A and I, I just think this is something that's really beautiful. And I know the internet can also be a very ugly place where the comment section of nearly every YouTube video can be something really horrible. Uh, uh, but it can also be a place where ideas are tested, and around the world we can engage with each other in a really positive way. But I want you to think about the marketplace of ideas as a big circle. And then just below that, about 90% as big, is what I'll call media, which makes up most of the marketplace of ideas. Because anytime you say something interesting at the dinner table, it eventually makes its way into media. That idea will become popular. It will go viral, whether it's through earned or paid media. It will go viral. Earned media is effectively an idea that, was, that earned recognition. But then underneath that is a trillion dollar engine that is paying for all of it. So when we just install an ad blocker and say, oh, let's just do it another way, because I don't like ads, you're changing the quid pro quo of the internet. And when big journalists, uh, 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 journalistic outlets put up paywalls, they struggle a lot. So they're trying to figure out how we can pay for real journalism. And it's not possible for us all to have everything we want. I want amazing content. I want TV to be the very best, like it has been lately. And I also want it all to be free. And I don't want uh, to share any information with anybody. And I don't, and I don't excuse me, want to look at any ads. That's not possible. And I, 
I actually believe advertising, partly because we've done so many things that are, uh, uh, that the advertising ecosystem has done so many things uh, uh, that are pushing the limits, especially since the advent of data-driven advertising, uh, that we've lost sight of the fact that advertising actually fuels growth. That without advertising, we cannot perpetuate even healthy economies, let alone healthy media. So if you look at where there's, the advertising is growing most, it is in the same places where the, the middle class is growing most. We are right now living through the advent of the fastest growing middle class in the history of the world. And it is not by accident that advertising is both going to those places as well as helping fuel those places. Places like China, places like Indonesia, like Vietnam. So really what I'm asking you is a question. What world do you want to live in? What do you want the internet to look like? I want to just point out a couple of things. I'm going to try to go really fast. One of the greatest achievements that Google made uh, was to basically take credit for all advertising. So what happens, and at Mercedes-Benz, they say it takes 20 years to make a Mercedes-Benz owner. So you're going to see ads for 20 years before you actually go buy a Mercedes. Because in order for you to buy a Mercedes and pay the premium that it is, you have to believe in that brand. And that's taken a long time for you to believe in that brand. But then what will happen is if you type in buy Mercedes-Benz, uh, uh, what has often happened is marketers then give all the credit to Google as you click on that link to go buy the Mercedes-Benz. And so one of the greatest things Google has done has taken an unfair share of, their, of the credit for all the work that went into selling that Mercedes-Benz because they got to touch it last. Facebook did something very similar, but because they didn't have quite as strong a position, the most brilliant thing they ever did was make it really easy to spend money on Facebook. You can spend money on Facebook in 90 seconds. Uh, uh, and to me, that is the genius of, of what uh, the, of the engine that Facebook has, has created. Uh, but we often give them credit for efficacy when the, the most credit we should be giving them is for easy and for the way that they assign credit. Incidentally, uh, uh, I think the best thing that we've done is something you've never heard of. I mean, we're a company you've probably not heard a lot about. But we created an ID that made it possible for the long tail of the internet, for the open internet, Everything that's not Google, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, the, 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 the part of media that is much bigger and much longer, we made it possible for them to have a common ID that is privacy safe so that we can have a common understanding of users, show relevant ads, and power programmatic advertising. And we did this for free. We gave it to the entire industry. It, it cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars, soon to be millions of dollars every month, and uh, uh, I charge nothing for it. And it's also that we can create a better internet and make it possible to create comparisons. So what is the value of Spotify over New York Times, over RTL, over Hulu? The ads on those properties, what is the value of them compared to each other? Without a common currency, that is not possible. And so we've worked hard to make that possible. But on top of that, I just want to make the case for, there we go, uh, for uh, programmatic advertising. So you may not know what programmatic advertising is. I think probably half the room probably knows what it is, and the other half of you, uh, uh, your life is shaped by it, but you have no idea what it is. Programmatic advertising is data-driven advertising. It's basically people using data to make better decisions about what ads to put in front of you. And programmatic advertising uh, uh, in the open internet does that without personally identifiable information, so it does it in a privacy-safe way and does that in a way that's super relevant. This, this is one of the most important things that the internet needs going forward. And, and, and here's why. Let me, let me just talk about a couple of the things that are really, I think, sacred to all of us. I am blown away at the value I get from Spotify. I think Spotify is one of the greatest companies I've ever been introduced to. As a consumer, I love it. I cannot believe how much money I spent when I was 17, 18 years old on, on CDs that now I can get nearly all music for $10. It's unbelievable. I actually sometimes wonder, how does Spotify really make all the math work? But I've spent enough time with Spotify being one of their partners to know that their business model is effectively, we have to get nearly everybody in the world to sign up for Spotify, and then we also have to show them relevant ads 
so that we can barely make it work, so that we can give as much economics to the artist as possible, one of which will be up here soon. And this all doesn't work. The music industry does not work without that. In fact, we tested this with the music industry. We almost imploded the music industry when the attorneys that ran that industry said, we're not going to change with the advent of the internet. And the only way that this works is if you take $4 CPMs and turn them into $8 CPMs. And the only way to do that is with relevance. That's the only way. No marketer will pay for it if it's not relevant. And if it's an $8 CPM, they expect it to perform better. This is just as important, if not more important, to something that's more sacred to a democratic and open internet, which is journalism. So there are many companies on this list that at times have struggled in the last 10 years to pay for themselves. And if you can't turn a $4 CPM into a $20 CPM, some of the companies right now that are really responsible for keeping the world honest will not be able to survive. So again, I just ask everybody to think about that when you install an ad blocker, but also to think about that when you are making the trade-offs between privacy and relevance in your own business, I beg you to do the right things as it relates to privacy. And I mean do the right thing, not just the thing that's required of you by law, but is responsible in terms of doing what you would want to do for you as a consumer. That's something I've always tried to operate by. I think it is actually part of the reason why we've been successful, but it's also what's required for a better internet. So uh, uh, something that is really great that has happened lately is that connected TV has changed everything about the internet. It has given a whole bunch of power to the long tail. And part of the reason why is because content owners have said, we're going to monetize it our own way. Uh, RTL here in Germany did one of the bravest things that I've seen in med media a couple years ago. They said, we are not going to put our content on YouTube. It's not because YouTube's bad or uh, anything like that. It's because we want to control our engagement with consumers, and we need the economics to be richer in order for us to produce the great content that we do. Some of these companies recognize the existential threat that too much power represents to them, and they're taking it on, and CTV will be a very different thing than other parts of media. So there is, as we march to a trillion dollars, we're in this tug of war. There's, if we do nothing, or if you do the wrong things, we can see things, we can see power continue to accumulate in a couple companies. On your iPhone, there will only be a few apps, or they will only be powered by a few companies. Or on the other side, you'll see a more democratic and open internet that is fueled because we all cooperated. In order for the open internet to be successful, people in this room have to be more cooperative. We have to have more of a spirit of, I want to work together to create something bigger than just my own company, and instead of just hoarding the advantage that we have. That's why I, I think our I, ID initiative was one of the most uh, uh, impressive things that we've done. Uh, 30 more seconds. Uh, uh, I was uh, standing on top of Mount Fuji two years ago, watching the sun come up. Uh, uh, and when that sliver of sun comes up for the first time in the day, there is this sense of hope, this sense that you almost can't describe without living it. But it is hope and a new beginning. I believe we are starting a new day on the internet, and it is up to us to define and decide what we want it to look like. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. You can take a couple questions. Yeah. yeah, no problem. A couple of questions. Sure. I mean, you, you gave us perspective on the internet, and you make it sound so easy. <laughs> what do you do? Huh? I mean, you're, you're building a huge, huge company, just showing the market cap and revenue. Why? What, what, what are you able to do different than all the competitors? What are you different, doing different than, than the, all these other ad tech companies that got funded? Some of them got sold, some of them are listed, but at a not very satisfying valuation. Um, how are you different? I mean, what, what's, what's the driving force? Uh, you know, there's a tech conference in San Francisco they have every year. It's called Disrupt. A and I actually think that's the wrong way to look at, at at least our business. I think a lot of businesses should think of it differently. It, uh, what we wrote in our S1 when we went public is we are not a disruptor. We're an enabler. 
we are trying to go to ad agencies, to marketers, uh, uh, to consumers even, and say, let's make the transition to a different internet. And so instead of us trying to sort of burn bridges or take something away from somebody else, we're trying to help them all. And if, if, if you help all of them, they not only will be better off, but you also make them your advocates. And so I, I just don't, I think most ad tech companies, as they got bigger, they developed lots of enemies, and we've tried really hard to develop lots of friends. That again sounds very easy, <laughs> uh, very, very simple, and if, if, if it just was so simple. But maybe you can explain a little bit. I'm not sure if everybody in the building understands the value chain. I mean, what's, what's the general business model? You turn to a media agency, you turn to a brand or an advertiser, and then you say, look, advertise through us. You offer them the tools, the system, the pipeline to all these publishers. Yeah, so we plug into all those companies. So we plug into Google, uh, we plug into uh, New York Times, we plug into uh, Spotify. Uh, uh, um, and then in real time, we look at 10 million ad opportunities every single second. And we try to help BMW figure out which of the 10 million they should buy. And they should only buy 250 of them. Uh, and they just need to carefully select what those are. And the way that we earn our keep is to make certain that they, add, they get more value than we charge them for in what we select. Because if you just buy at random, you'll get your ass kicked every time. So basically, it's, it's, it's banner advertising, display advertising is, is your... Oh, no, 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 no. So the reason I was talking about TV and audio is it's, it, a display is a tiny portion of our business. It's mostly about video and mobile, in-app, like every form of digital advertising. Connected TV is, is the most exciting piece of business that we're touching right now. But TV is? Yeah, it's connected TV. So anything that touches the internet, we're helping people objectively decide what to buy. And that, that's one of the things that brands love about us is, uh, uh, should I buy this ad on Hulu, or should I buy an audio ad on Spotify, or should I buy a display ad on Yahoo? Well, all of those have some value, and when you're making a relative comparison, it, one better be 10 times cheaper than the other in order to be worth it. So you're assigning value to everything. I mean, you, you look at a couple of markets across the world. I mean, you know, like the media distribution in all these different markets. Yeah, so it, uh, media, so it, take for instance, Procter and Gamble, who has something like 150 brands that they're advertising for in nearly every country in the world. If we just say to them, oh, we only help you in the US, they would be like, thanks anyway. We need a global player. Most of our revenue comes from outside the United States. Uh, so we've looked at this as, the only way to be successful is to be global and be omnichannel. Uh, uh, so that means that we have to have offices all over the world. We have 25 offices around the world. We have an office here in Hamburg. Uh, um, and it's absolutely required for us to be successful. I, I made a couple of predictions this morning in my opening keynote. And I said, the prices on the internet for media, for clicks, for every, all the ways you can buy media are going up and up and up. And it's getting more and more expensive. And that might be a, a signal, or it might be the moment when classic media sort of like sees a renaissance, sees um, advertisers coming back to classic media because they see they can, they can pay uh, flat prices or CPM prices that are actually lower. and They get more, um, more reach and more relevance for their ad investment. Is that fair to say? Um, well, so I think it's less about the average. And it is true that the average is going up, but that's partly because things like connected TV are coming online, and that's way more valuable than the banner you were looking at on your phone or display ads. So the averages are going up. But the, the more important thing is that the bell curve is also getting wider. And uh, the price and the value, there's more disparity between those two things than there's ever been. And that's why it's really important that people are using data to make more informed decisions, whether that's online or offline. And the thing that offline has going against it is that there's not really a, an easy way to make data-driven decisions, especially on microtransactions. You tend to buy in bulk. You cross your fingers and hope for the best. And that's where digital, just long term, not only do people want to consume it that way, but it just has a, an efficacy advantage, which is that's where all the data is. I also made a couple of comments this morning on banner advertising and display advertising. And I mean, you coming from this, from this field, right? I mean, Trade I think, has a, has a legacy in, 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 that, in that area and in, in, in buying banners. And I, and I, I said that um, 
you need to really put discounts on the banners in order to really make the people care and really make the people click and, and then convert. If you, if you just put a banner out there, it's really hard um, to convince a user. Is that something that you see as well? I think that's absolutely right. Because part of the reason why the price on banners has stayed as high as it has is not because of its efficacy. It's because of the way credit gets distributed. You get credit for touching the user, not for impacting the user. And that's the next transformation that advertising is going through, which is where, do we, where and how do we assign credit? And when that happens, more credit will go to television and connected TV. I mean, just think about it. Th that 30-second spot has way more impact on the way you think. Spotify's ads has way more impact on the way you think, because you give them your attention in the way that a banner typically doesn't. As we get better at assigning value as an industry, the price of those banners will go down. The number of those banners will go down, thank God. Uh, uh, and then we will all have a better, more relevant internet where people are crediting efficacy and not uh, touching. I give you guys a little behind the scenes uh, insight. When we prepared this, uh, discussed this presentation, in the beginning you said, I want to talk about China. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to, like, my whole keynote is supposed to be around China, because that's apparently a huge uh, important market for you. Now you've not been talking about China, but we had a different uh, keynote here an hour, two hours ago um, by a manager from JD. Um, can you maybe like, say a few words on the media and advertising market in China and the role that you intend to play there? Yeah, so, so uh, China right now is experiencing the largest surge in middle class in the history of the world. In the next 12-ish years, there will be two United Stateses worth of middle class added in China, where 12% of the population, uh, uh, which is currently middle class, will go to 70% of the population. That is a game changer for the entire planet. And what happens is uh, uh, about 30% uh, uh, of some brand spend is in China, while sometimes 50 or 60% of the purchases are done in China. So there's this big gap of how much money is spent advertising in China uh, versus the amount of consumption or purchases that are done there. And as the middle class emerges, that gap's only going to get worse. And the only way to solve that is for the rest of the world to understand the opportunity that is China and figure out how to speak more internationally, if you will. Because most of the biggest brands in the world are loved in China, but the, the brands themselves don't know how to go in there don't know how to advertise. Honestly, they're a little afraid of it. Uh, uh, and that's the role we tend to play, is that to all of these brands, we say, we've had a 10-year relationship where you've trusted us with your data. Let us help you do that very same thing in China. And we started first, not by running into China, but by actually carefully in China developing close partnerships and trust with Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent in particular. But trust is the thing that is the biggest barrier to entry in China. Okay, you, you, I mean, from your perspective, like sitting there in the US and running a global business that you founded, talking to inv your investors and, and your business partners across the globe, what's, what's your perspective on Europe and maybe on Germany in particular? So uh, uh, Europe, without a doubt, its best days are in front of it. And Seriously? Yes, without a doubt. And, and Germany is one of the leaders in sort of making it realize its potential. Germany has this amazing blend of practicality and engineering thinking. And because so much of the world in the future will be controlled by engineers and by software and things that have been created by engineers, Germany is going to play a more central role in the global economy than they have. You don't have to say that only because of here. No, I would say that if I were in China. I would say the exact same thing anywhere in the world. There is a humongous opportunity for Europe, especially Europe has done as good a job as anybody at creating premium brands. It hasn't done the best job at taking those to the world. In some cases it has, like in autos, but there is so much opportunity to take those to the world. And I think everybody, for the most part, needs to do what I'm urging my company to do, was, is be a global citizen. Like we say all the time, we are not an American company. We are a global company that happens to be based in the United States. And I think it's more important in business than ever to create that distinction. How many people do you have on the ground here in Europe? Uh, so we've got a, about 300 people here. In Europe? On all of Europe, yes, spread out. Okay, and in China? In China, we've got a few, uh, well, in all of Asia, we've got a few hundred people as well. Okay. So.
Okay, so, so, so what's the value of your company right now? Uh, so it was 10 billion a week or so ago. I haven't checked today's market. But roughly You're not checking? Days. No, I don't check every day. You don't go crazy you if you check I mean, this guy day. founded a $10 billion company, and he doesn't check what no. the actual value is. No. We're in it for the long haul. It's going to come up and down. It's not like I sell stock every day. It's going to go up and down. How much? OK, I, I have to ask this uh, question. Uh, you uh, used it. It's probably disclosed somewhere anyways. How much of this $10 billion is yours? Uh, I'm not going to say. You can look it up. Uh, it, but that's not what motivates me, so I don't want to talk about it. I also don't want people it, it, to contact me asking me for money. <laughs> Nobody would. I mean, that would, yeah, but is, anybody is that, can look it up. Is, 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 it, is it more than ten percent? I'm not going to say. What else do you want to talk about? <laughs> oh, I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing story. Yeah, uh, I made more money than I ever dreamed I would, but it was never about the money. If I would have, if it was about the money, I would have played it safe and stayed at Microsoft. For me, it was about creating change in all the things we talked about today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe some last questions from the bar. I mean, maybe Kevin as well. Michael. Philip, you, you just took all questions for us. We, we, we have no more questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Come on. So, so I, 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 come on. Oh, oh I'm going to hide it back there. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, so you were talking a lot about, I think you call it the free democratic internet. But then, I, I totally understand the idea, but then on the other hand, if it wasn't for paid media, you maybe would have had now your first female president. So um, what are your thoughts on regulations uh, for, for paid advertising and on social, and what do you think about um, how people mistreat the opportunities you were just talking about? Do you think there has to be some kind of regulations? Yeah, so I do think that regulation is Regulation is coming whether people want it or not. So there are a lot of companies who, for a long time, like the IAB, for instance, for a long time said, let us self-regulate. Let's, let, us, uh, let us do the right thing, and we will. And there were some players who didn't. And some players didn't take enough uh, caution. I, I, I'm sure if Facebook could go back in time, they would change some of the choices they made, and they would say, well, we should have been a little more careful. Even though I think they're, they're working as hard as they can to make change now, I think they wish they would have done more sooner. I think everybody wishes they would have done more sooner. So regulation is coming. I think that's fine. But what I, what I want to keep calling out is that big companies who say, I'm doing an amazing job, and then don't really talk about the issue, which is the quid pro quo of the internet, just making me type in my Apple ID 50,000 times doesn't help consumers better understand the quid pro quo of the internet. And when politicians stand up and say, I'm, I'm here for privacy, and then they never get specific and they don't even understand how it works, they just want to pass a bill that says privacy, but then in terms of actually where the rubber meets the road and, and weighing in on the question of how the internet is going to pay, pay for itself, when they don't actually want to get in, involved in that, they just want to stay clear, uh, then I get frustrated with the state of the dialogue. But as long as people are trying to actually do the right thing, uh, I welcome regulation uh, because it is going to strike a balance between relevant advertising and privacy. And there's plenty of room in between those, uh, which is why I, I'm, I'm passionate in talking about it. If I didn't believe that was possible, I would quietly try to like, navigate my business through all of this, knowing that long term there isn't a good answer. Long term, there's a great answer. We just have to all try to get there. Thank you. Well, one more, yeah, 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 yeah. One, one more question. I mean, maybe Kevin, I mean, you, Michael, YouTube was mentioned. So you, you talked a lot about Google and Facebook. What is your perspective on Amazon? Uh, so Amazon is a very interesting company. They also are one of the most powerful companies in the world. Uh, in some ways, they're more fragmented uh, than uh, Google or Facebook, where there's a lot of people putting uh, work into a bunch of things that I'm super supportive of. I'm a client of Amazon's on AWS, like probably ha half or more of the room. Uh, but Amazon has more conflict of interest uh, uh, than probably any company in the world that is that big. I mean, if you think about the relationship that they have with retailers uh, or, or people that make products, I'll sell your product for you. I want to do some advertising for you. Uh, uh, but then they also have white label products that compete with them. Uh, and the, the, the healthy tension that they have between uh, uh, their merchants and their own products and the pricing power that they have because they've gotten so big 
is one of the most interesting things in sort of concentrated economics that we can really study. And the jury's out as to what they do long term with the power that they've aggregated. And I think it's just really important that we as consumers stay in tune with what they're doing so that, that we never give them the opportunity to abuse the power. Maybe that's what happened with Facebook, is enough aggregated and through uh, negligence, not through any malice, they made a mistake. Uh, I, I think it's important for us as consumers to watch Amazon to not let that happen. But Amazon is an amazing company. I order from them hundreds of times a year. I, I'm blown away by the consumer surplus that they create. And uh, uh, they're an amazing partner as well. So uh, uh, um, watch carefully, but they're great. OK, OK, OK. Are you all good? OK, OK. Thank you very much Thank for being so much. here, Jeff, really for doing it. this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for